Hey campfellers, it's the last one of the year and I am really happy to have the lovely Skeplet. Brian, Brennan McKenzie is here chatting to us about something that's really important to Cam. Try to use evidence to help you make the right choices for you and your dog. So I'm going to let Brennan introduce himself. Then we're going to go into a section about why is it important working out whether it works or not. Sounds daft, mm. but it's really important. We're then going to make sure that all emotion leaves the building and we talk about these topics in an evidence-based fashion. Some people are going to be, yay, that's brilliant to hear. And some people are going to be really disappointed if the evidence doesn't support their intervention. But we're going to just try and take a little bit of emotion out of it and just concentrate. So, Brennan, tell us about yourself. <laughs> Uh, thanks. It's great to be here. I think this is a really important topic. I have a lot of respect for what you're doing. I think we need to, to reach out to people and, and get people engaged in solving some of these really serious chronic long-term problems and arthritis is a huge one. So kudos to you for doing this. Um, in terms of my background, um, I'm one of the classic always loved animals, but my interest in that started as, you know, wanting to run off and, and do wildlife biology and jump out of helicopters onto rhinos and things like that. So I did my, uh, my university training in biology. I also did uh, a degree in literature because I can't decide what I like and I like everything. So, so that's, that's will come in useful later because I do a lot of writing now. Um, yeah. And I uh, eventually decided I wanted to be Jane Goodall or, or an approximation of her. So I uh, went to graduate school in animal behavior and studied primates and tried for several years to make a living as a, as a primate behaviorist, which uh, also proved challenging. So I actually drifted into veterinary medicine late. I was in my early 30s when I went to train as a veterinarian at the University of Pennsylvania uh, here in the United States. And that has proven to be, you know, an amazingly vibrant and ever-changing developing career. Uh, yeah. I, I do get, I do feel like I'm constantly trying to learn and grow. And this is a great place to do that because there's so much left to know. Um, the sort of last stop, most recent stop, I won't say last stop on that train was uh, I did a master's degree in epidemiology through the University of London a few years ago, because I think the issue that, that I kind of brought up about how do we know what we know is really huge. And I don't think that veterinarians or pet owners really understand how complicated it is and how difficult it is to figure out whether the treatments that we're using actually work and, mm -hmm. and whether they're safe. And so um, there's a whole area of science dedicated to just doing that. And that's become a, a big part of my interest. Um, that all led me to trying to share what I've learned. You know, I see this as a learning journey and, and I figure I put a lot of work into stuff. I want to share that with people. So about 11 years ago now, I started the SkepVet blog, which was just a place to put information that I had figured out in my travels. And, and uh, a lot of that centered initially around alternative therapies. It's become a lot broader than that because there's just so much in veterinary medicine that we don't know and that we, we have to keep working to figure out and understand better. Um, that's become a media empire now. I have a Facebook page and a YouTube channel and all sorts of things like that. I'm trying, I'm trying not to be old. I'm trying to be hip and with the times. And, and yeah, so, no, that's so funny because um, when I had my branding experience for Cam, I was like, I really want to be trendy. <laughs> <laughs> okay let's do a trendy color scheme then and i was like it is you have to be engaging online we're competing mm -hmm. against people that have got their their voice and message their vibrant color scheme so it is it is a competitive world to get airspace isn't it right so blah, blah. let's talk about why is it important that we work out whether something works or not and how do we do it and focus on arthritis because that's what we're about Right. I mean, you know, I think we're all starting from the same place, right? Veterinarians and dog owners, and I have two dogs myself, one of whom is, you know, 15 and has gotten pretty creaky. Um, we want a good quality of life. We want, you know, our pets to be pain free. We want them to be happy and vibrant and enjoy their life. Mm -hmm. And we're really driven to do that. And, and it's hard to sit and watch them change over time. It's hard to sit and watch arthritis take away some of the activities that they enjoy in their life. And that creates a motivation to do stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a there's a downside to that, which is that sometimes if you leap in and do stuff and it doesn't really work or it does more harm than good, then you're not achieving your goals. And so we have to think carefully about 
you know, what can we do and how do we know if it works or not? And that starts with understanding what arthritis is, understanding the, what we call pathophysiology, all the little mechanics and biology and chemistry that go into making a joint arthritic and painful and, and the inflammation and all of the things that happen there, because that gives us a better understanding of how we could manipulate that system and make it work better and make it more comfortable. And then we have to think about how do we test ideas? I, I come up with a great idea. Oh, well, there's a lot of inflammation here and, and this supplement or this drug is an anti-inflammatory, so it might help with arthritis. Now, how do I find out if that's actually true, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, it starts with what we call preclinical research, doing test tube stuff and maybe stuff with animals in the lab to see if it actually works. And, and people are often shocked to find out how often good ideas don't actually work in the real world right? Most of the ideas they come up with for, for medicines, for pharmaceuticals, never make it to market. People spend 10 years studying it and realize it actually doesn't work because nature is complicated, way more complicated than we are. And it's hard for us to understand it. And simple, straightforward answers, you know, are rarely there. So there's a whole process of studying and testing things. And the end point of that is to put it in real animals with real arthritis in the real world, right? Your dog, mm -hmm. my dog, you know, and then to watch what happens in a systematic way. And this is the hardest part, I think, for people to understand and to accept. Um, the, we're very good as, as creatures, as human beings, at looking at the world and seeing relationships between things and figuring out that that's connected to that and that caused that to happen. But that system goes wrong an awful lot, right? Uh, you know, you, your dog is getting worse and worse and limper, limpier and limpier and more and more uncomfortable. And finally you feel like I gotta do something and you try something and it starts to get better. And it's obvious that what you did was the reason it got better, right? I mean, what other explanation could there be? Except that, again, life is complicated. There's lots of things happening in your dog's life and in their body and in their physiology. You're probably trying more than one thing at a time. You're behaving differently. You're walking them differently. All these things happen. And the only thing that you know about is the one thing that you're focused on that you did. So you yeah. give that the credit or the blame for whatever happens. But yeah. that's why we have science, right? Because we have ways of figuring out whether stuff actually is directly responsible or whether it's an accident or a coincidence or you know, we can talk a little bit about a placebo effect and what that means. There are all of these things that confuse us. So the starting point is we all want the best for our pets and our patients. And we have to think a little bit about how we get there. And it's sometimes, unfortunately, more complicated than just trying stuff and seeing what happens, which is what most of us vets and, and owners alike tend to want to do. Yeah, no, we do. And I think um, I was saying to you earlier that I'm a, a typical example. Yeah, I went to university, I went to vet school, but that area of training, I don't think really um, came with me as such. I, I learned lots of other stuff, but when I was actually out in the field and I was like, Crikey, I've got to I've got to really work out whether this does work and I've got to read these papers and understand these papers and they're complicated they're like mm -hmm. and there's loads of references to, to statistics and stuff and I, I don't understand so it's actually really really difficult isn't it you know to try and elucidate whether an intervention works is not easy so when you have somebody say Right, the classical example, you're walking your dog around the park, you bump into Mabel by the poo bin and she says, oh, yeah, I've been just buying this new thing from the pharmacy down the road. It's absolutely fine. It's worked wonders. I tell you, it works wonders. That's not reliable. I'd say. Right. And it's painful, you know, for, for all of us. I mean, you know, because I will I will give something to clients for their arthritis and I will even say to them, look, you know, the evidence is limited. We don't know for sure. But, you know, we, we have a problem we want to try to solve here try it and see what happens. The overwhelming majority of people will come back to me and you know, two weeks later and say, yeah, things are better. And I feel good, they feel good, we're all happy. The trick though is what happens if six weeks later they're like, you know, it seemed like it was working, but now it doesn't seem to be working anymore. Mm -hmm. What happens if you know a month or two months or a year later a study comes out and we tried this you know, in a hundred dogs and it didn't work in hardly any of them? What mm -hmm. do you do? that right there's uncertainty there and uncertainty is just terrible and we hate it and that's happened i mean i think most of you probably have heard about tramadol i was gonna say tramadol which is a great, you know it's a drug that veterinarians leapt on when it came to the market because it's a proven pain medication in humans it works pretty well um it seemed to have pretty minimal side effects made dogs a little sleepy or a little wobbly sometimes yeah. but you know, compared to a lot of other things, it seemed really, really safe. And we used it like candy for mm -hmm. years, right? 
And, you know, some of us, and I'm, I'm one of the annoying ones, is writing little articles going, you know, actually dogs don't make the metabolite that in people does the work. So are we sure it's really working in dogs? But absolutely, almost everyone I gave it to for their pets said, yeah, they feel better. Yeah. And then we did a couple of studies. And if you do the placebo and people don't know who's getting the drug and who's not getting the drug, it doesn't seem like it works. And yeah. that's not just a curiosity, right? That's not just an ac academic ivory tower thing. That's hundreds of dogs who weren't getting pain relief and we all thought they were. And we felt yeah. good about what we were doing, but we were wrong. And we have to yeah. have you know, humility as veterinarians and as owners to realize that when that happens, we need to think about what's best for our pets. And that means we need to move on and, and work on something else. And we need to be cautious about the next thing that we think works if we don't have the evidence, right? Yeah, so what kind of thing? So when, say um, somebody comes to see me um, and they, they bought the dog and he's had a bit of a, de bit of a severe deterioration, I can't speak tonight, severe deterioration. And they found something that they'd like to try. And I'm like, well, there's not enough evidence. You're not so sure, but you know, okay. Um, and they do see improvements and then subsequently in the future we go downhill again what kind of things could be happening to explain that apparent improvement so that people know that we're talking about sure so there are several things the one of the most common is what we call regression to the mean or the natural history of disease right um you know arthritis isn't steady all the time and it doesn't go in a straight line downwards you have good days and bad days things get better for a while they get worse for a while and again, we don't always understand why that is. You know, we all talk about, well, it's getting cold and rainy outside and my knee's acting up. But, you know, we're always looking for explanations. But the fact is that, that arthritis is one of those waxing and waning diseases where sometimes it's better and sometimes it's worse. So yeah. when you go to your vet with your pet and say, I need something for my dog, not when it's good, right? You go when it's been getting worse and getting worse. And at some point you're like, this is just not okay anymore. I need to do something. And you go and you try something. And then it gets a little better and a little better, right? But if it was going up and down anyway, and you hit it right there at that point at the top, then maybe it was going to get better by itself. There's no way to know for sure in any individual pet. Maybe the treatment worked or maybe not. But the trick is that a lot of times with these chronic diseases that come and go, we seek help when they're at their worst and when they're about to get better on their own anyway. So that's, that's one thing that we need to account for when we do studies. The other is what we call the caregiver placebo. That's probably the biggest one. Human beings are just hardwired to see what we want and expect to see in the world around us, right? Yeah. And we're hardwired to see the world in terms of our past experiences and beliefs. And so, you know, we always say, well, placebos don't have anything to do with animals because they don't have beliefs or ideas about their treatments, but we do, right? And it's been shown very conclusively in dogs, in cats, in arthritis, but also in other studies and things like epilepsy that if you do a blinded study, if you have a study where half the dogs randomly get the drug and the other half uh, randomly get nothing, you know, a little pill that has nothing in it, and nobody knows which is which, that about half of the pet owners and, and this is really important, half of the veterinarians think the dogs getting the nothing are getting better, right? Yeah, it's scary, isn't and, it? And when you measure more objective things, like you put Fitbits on them and watch their activity, or you have them walk across a plate that measures how much weight they're putting on their legs, they don't get better right? Yeah. We're being fooled by what we expect or hope to see, mm -hmm. right? And, and that just means that there's an extra responsibility on us to be careful about our observations. You know, I don't, if someone says to me, well, I've tried this new thing and my dog's a lot better, you know, unless I clearly have a reason to think that that is harmful, I don't tell them, stop, don't do it, that's wrong, right? I just say, look, we have to be real mindful that that may not actually represent what's really happening in your dog's life. And we don't mm -hmm. want them to be painful, even just because we think things are better. So we need to keep track. And, and there are tools, and you know better than I do, about you know monitoring tools and assessment tools and ways that we can keep track of the course over the long haul so that we get a better sense of when there are ups and downs and whether things are really yeah. working or not. Yeah, and I think also, I definitely know from when I had my dog that at the same time as introducing a new intervention, I might have picked her up a new bed or I might have walked her to a new park or I might have done something slightly different because I was putting a bit more effort because I was worried, I was upset, I changed things, you know, I, I lifted her out of the car or, or silly things like that. You just start changing your behaviour a little bit and they receive the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. And we also know that we have dogs, they're so emotionally connected with us as well. And I only need to raise my voice and Luna's like, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> 
And um, so when you start to pay them more attention, more love, etc., maybe that brings them up a level two as well. And it is really complicated. And I know a lot of the CAM followers probably go, oh, for God's sake, Hannah, just tell us what works. <laughs> I'd be a millionaire by now if I could come up and just say, yeah, well, that works. Buy it. But we can't do that because that's actually lying. <laughs> so, so. Right, right. And nobody yeah. wants to, and nobody wants to to be giving something that doesn't work. And so, no. you know, the key is that we're all starting from that same place, right? We all want things to be better for our dogs. And the question yeah. is just, you know, thinking about how we best do that. And and it's frustrating that there aren't simple right and wrong answers most of the time. There's always yeah. a gray area, and that's that's biology, that's medicine, that's something we've yeah. learned to live with. So <laughs> let's just um, before we start tackling some of the doesn't <clears throat> work. That's where everybody takes emotions, put them outside the door and just look. Um, let's just talk about a couple of things that are real, um, real misdemeanor mistakes. Like, So if you see a study and it's all being done in vitro, you know, that's a bit of a giveaway. We're not actually doing it in the actual animal, in that actual disease state, in that real life situation. So what happens in a Petri dish cannot be used as strong evidence that it's going to be good for your dog in Pennsylvania in the winter um what other things when people are reading papers like the the size of the study so the amount of animals within the study also is a really important thing to think about what other things could we say to people? yeah i mean so there are a system of things that we use to control for what we call bias and bias has a negative connotation it means that you know you're you're thinking wrong about something but that isn't really what it means in in research it just means you know, mistaken uh, observations that don't actually correlate with what's really happening, right? Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of ki types of bias. And so there are ways to, to manage that. Some of them are things like what we call, what we talked about for blinding, right? The idea that if the people in the study are doing some kind of subjective assessment, like I'm doing a, a, a survey of questions to see if my dog's arthritis is getting better or worse, or, you know, a veterinarian's doing an exam and doing manipulations and seeing if it's more or less painful after a drug. If we're doing something that's inherently subjective that you have to interpret by looking at it. Um, that's only going to be reliable if you don't know whether the dog is getting the treatment or getting the placebo. If you know, you're likely to unconsciously shift your views in, con in consistent with what you believe, right? If I'm expecting to get pain somewhere in a dog and I'm pushing and I'm not getting pain, and I'm like, no, there really should be pain here. Yeah, part of me is probably pushing a little harder right there, right? Just because that's how our brains work. So, so you wanna look for blinding or masking. You wanna look for a study where nobody knows until the very end who's getting what, right? And yeah. especially the people who are doing the assessing and especially if the assessment is some kind of, of observation. It's yeah. a little more reliable to do other things like you know measuring uh, how much weight they put on a force plate when they're walking or activity monitors. There are a few things that are a little less susceptible, but it really ideally nobody should know until the end who's getting what. That's yeah. a big one. Um, there's another one called randomization. So you know individuals are different. Some dogs respond differently to treatments than others. Some have more or less pain and and react differently to pain. So if you pick like all the really bad dogs and you put them in the placebo group and all the really good dogs who don't have much pain at all in the treatment group, well the treatment's going to look like it works a whole lot better. So yeah. we have a system where we assign dogs and nobody knows who goes in which group, right? Nobody gets yeah. to pick. It's random. Some computer yeah. or some number chart decides who goes in which group. That's yeah. a really important one for making sure that the study is reliable. Size is a tricky one. Um, there's no question that a bigger study is better in some ways. You can do a badly run study with a thousand dogs and still get a bad answer if you don't have blinding and placebo and you know appropriate measures, right? But, yeah. uh, but it is better. The reality is our studies are always gonna be small in veterinary medicine because we don't have the kind of money that you see in human medicine. And the example I always use of this is glucosamine, which is you know commonly used arthritis therapy, right? In dogs, we have, the last time I checked, two clinical trials. Each of them had about 30 to 40 dogs in them and they lasted about three months, right? And you yeah. go through the human literature, there are trials with 5,000 people that go on for three years and there are a hundred of them, right? Yeah. So, you know, we're never going to have that. Bigger yeah. is better, but probably the methodology is more important that, okay. that people's bias and, and observations are controlled for a little bit. That's really the key thing. I don't expect people to spend a lot of time analyzing the statistics. You know, I spent three years doing a master's and I don't understand the statistics half the time in the papers I read. You know, realistically, you need to ask a statistician, is this okay or were they cheating? And most of the time, that's the only way you're going to know. So, you know, that's a hard one even for, for vets to analyze.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also, who actually paid for the trial? I think is another big corker. You know, if the, if the mm-hmm. person who is producing the product and commissioning the study to sell more of their product, I think that's a little bit of a yeah. Yeah, funding bias is a huge thing, and and it's a it's again it's there's two sides to that. One is that there's no doubt that the funder influences how the study is how the question is asked, mm-hmm. and and how the study is designed. And that has an influence on the on the outcome. In the perfect world, the funder doesn't have anything to do with how the study is conducted. So you can still get reasonable evidence out of a study funded by somebody with a bias if you have good methods, right? If you have good bias control, good randomization, stuff like that. But even at the point where they set up and design the study and how they ask the question, you're going to get some influence. So in human medicine, there's very good evidence that you know industry funding influences the outcome of studies. Um, the the counterpoint to that, though, is that that's where most of the money is, right? We have Morris Animal Foundation. We have a few charity groups that will fund research, but very little, right? And I don't think we can just willy-nilly throw out any evidence that we have because it was paid for by somebody who has an interest in the outcome. We have to be a little careful about that because then we go from having not very much to nothing. Right. Yeah. We have to look critically at that evidence. And ideally, we want to have more than one study by more than one group who have different biases and different perspectives to get us to the answer. So I agree. Funding bias is a huge problem, but it's not one that's going to be easy to solve. So we need to find ways to deal with the evidence we have. Yeah. And then I'm going to say a shocker now. Yeah. Just the person that's leading the marketing campaign, be careful. You know, you might have a, a big name. But just check, you know, if they got a vested interest um, and just see, you know, are they being paid to stand up and talk about the product? It's um, it's complicated, isn't it? I think in in the human world, you're not allowed a drug company is not allowed to take people out for lunches and stuff now. And all of that sort of stuff, isn't it? Yeah, there, there are some there are some controls on that. It doesn't work great. There's still we're finding out all the time that the industry is finding ways to influence things and to get involved in writing papers. And the biggest problem and, and you know, Ben Goldacre, who's, who's over there, is one of the, the best, you know, at pointing out some of the problems in, in the pharma industry. And one of the biggest problems is actually one we don't think about, which is that they don't publish things that don't work. Right. Yes. The the most useful evidence for me most of the time is negative evidence. Knowing mm-hmm. the tramadol didn't work saved me from mistreating a whole bunch of dogs. Yeah. Right. And a lot of times companies will bury studies that show that their po- products don't work and we never know. So we keep doing it thinking. And then we, yeah, we keep saying, oh, well, no evidence doesn't mean that there's no evidence when actually there. Yikes. So having <laughs> already planted a bomb. <laughs> Let's crack on. What shall we talk about? Um, do you want to go straight in for the kill? There's this one. Sure. Zoopharmacognosi, zoo, zoo that's a fantastic one. Um, I actually did a blog post on that, which uh, probably goes into a lot more details a few years back. So, you know, I don't know if I'll have all of the, the points right at the tip of my tongue. So what that means, zoopharmacognosi zoo is this idea that animals have an instinct for selecting um, usually plants, but things in their environment that have medicinal value. Um, and so that one of the ways that, that we can decide what might be a useful therapy, for example, for arthritis, is what do animals with arthritis naturally gravitate towards, particularly animals in the wild who have a wide selection of things to munch on or to try. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a really interesting idea. Um, I, I think it has both uh, some positive sides to it and some negative sides to it. So the positive first, uh, you know, plant are a fantastic source of chemicals that have medicinal value. And this is where most of our medicines come from. We go out and we survey the plant world and they make all kinds of interesting things. And we sort through them and figure out what they do and how they work. And a lot of them turn into medicines. There's a really long, complicated process to that. It's not just about going out and grabbing leaves off a bush and chewing on them. But the fact is that the plants are a wonderful source. And if we could identify the most promising candidates by watching what animals in the wild are doing, that would be awesome. That would be great. Mm -hmm. The reality is that the evidence is pretty limited. The best evidence honestly comes from insects. There are uh, some butterflies who um, choose which plant to lay their eggs on based on how heavily parasitized they are. If they have a bunch of parasites and they know those parasites are going to um, eat their young, eat the larvae, they'll lay their eggs on a more toxic plant. 
fewer of their larvae will survive because the plant's not as good for the butterfly larvae, but it kills the parasites. So more will survive than wow. the real if they've been on a different plant, right? Yeah. But if they don't have a lot of parasites, they pick the less toxic plant because then they get more babies out of that. And mm -hmm. you know, butterflies aren't thinking about this. This is something that has evolved over a period of time. So there are cases where animals in the wild definitely do make choices about plants and about things that have some medicinal input. I would say, unfortunately, most of the more complicated and more exciting ones, like you know the chimpanzees who are out there taking things for their worms and stuff like that, don't hold up really well. Um, and, and I think, you know, as a, as a vet who's taken car batteries and, and keys and plastic toys and all kinds of terrible things out of animals over year, over the years, I don't think dogs have a very good sense of what's good for them and not good for them. So I don't know that we can necessarily rely on that in our pets. I think it's an interesting area and it might trigger us to investigate some plants we wouldn't otherwise investigate. Um, mm -hmm. So I actually was surprised to find that there was a little more evidence than I thought but it doesn't really translate very well into, you know, some of the claims I hear, which is here, offer your horse these six things and whichever one they pick is the best one for their health. Cause I don't think that really works. Okay, good one. Guys, you are welcome to put your questions and we, we made a pact at the beginning of this, didn't we? We're gonna take them, we're gonna, we're gonna do the questions. And that's why we said leave emotions at the door and let's just talk like adults. What should we go on to next while we wait for people to ask? Um, well, I mean, we, you mentioned it before, the, the elephant in the room, right? Supplements, right? Because this is this is one of the biggest areas. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we do have for arthritis and what we know. I would say that, that you know, the thing that, that we have the most evidence about, that we know the most about both the benefits and the risks of is probably non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, right? Mm -hmm. These are kind of the mainstay for arthritis therapy. And I think there are problems with having that in that we tend to rely exclusively or excessively on that. Mm -hmm. But I think there are also problems with the amount of, you know, ensetophobia out there that people are very afraid of these drugs and of the side effects that they have. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is one area where we have put a whole lot of time and money and effort into research. And we do know that these are often very safe and very effective drugs. So, you know, the first thing I say to people when it reaches the point where I think, you know, the risk of medication is worth it in terms of the benefit for an individual pet is let's not operate from fear, right? Let's mm -hmm. operate from knowledge. We know what these drugs do in a lot of detail. I can tell you that, you know, if your dog has pre-existing kidney or liver problems, we have to be careful. We have to avoid this, we have to do that. But I can also tell you that if you just go, eh, these things are scary, I don't want to use them, your dog will suffer more than they need to, right? Yeah, I've got a brilliant one that um, Zoe Belshaw, she, she uses brand. Mm -hmm. Benefits, risks, alternatives, what if I do nothing? Mm -hmm. Her brain during every console is going benefits, risks, alternative, nothing. And I love that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that's exactly what we should always be thinking about. Not, is it good or bad? Does it work or does it not work? Because there's rarely a simple answer. But what are the benefits? What are the risks? What else could we do? Yeah, and what happens if we don't treat? Because sometimes we don't have to. Right? So. What I actually really love about that is I could use that in a consult. I could say the benefits of doing this, the risks would be this. There are no alternatives that I know of that fit with what you want to do with your lifestyle, with your pet that you can afford. Um, and, but if we do nothing, this is a note when we can't do nothing, yep. you come to me with a problem and this is a problem. So I, I find that brilliant. Um, yeah. So that's really useful. And, and so then, you know, we go from there to all the other stuff, right? When you talk about alternatives, there's an incredible multi-billion dollar market in other stuff, right? Um, yeah. And that exists for a reason. That exists because what we have in medicine, what we have in NSAIDs is not sufficient. It doesn't work for everybody. The risks aren't always worth taking depending on the benefits. So, you know, there's a reason people are seeking other things. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we're in a, in a situation where companies that make stuff to sell to you don't have to do very much. One, to prove that they're, they work. Two, to prove that they say they're safe, right? And three, to, um, make sure that what they're actually selling you is what they say they're telling you. There's a huge quality control problem in the marketplace where even if I can say to somebody, you know, this supplement has some decent research that shows it might help. But if you go buy it half the time, the thing you take off the shelf doesn't actually have any of the stuff in it because nobody's watching, nobody's testing. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we start doing that benefits, risks, alternatives, conversation, 
that's one of the toughest ones is that there's a reason why we're looking for alternatives and there are a lot of them out there and it's rare that we have really clear definitive answers and and there's some problems with that market so that means that you know it's not as simple as let's try it and see what happens it's let's sit down and have a discussion which you know that should be doing anyway right the problem is we are time limited and uh, it is really difficult like as you know i'm pretty damn passionate about this topic and my Consults in 2013 might have been 15 to 20 minutes. By about 2015, they were heading to 40 minutes and everybody in the practice hated me. By 2017, I needed to step out because I couldn't condense what I wanted that owner to know so that they could start their journey safely and wisely. And one of the areas that I did spend time on was talking about non steroidals because they needed to understand the disease, to understand how the drugs would work, and it gave them confidence. And I do feel a lot of people go and start looking for alternatives and disregard something we have a lot of evidence about. Mm -hmm. Somebody in the past has planted a seed or they've read something that's given them the, the, the willies about it. Mm -hmm. but we can actually give them just a bit of time and confidence. I think that's really important. Unfortunately, I think there is there's strong evidence that owners don't really want to go to the drug company websites for obvious reasons because they'll mm -hmm. be biased. The onus really is on us vets, but recent years, people believe vets are just there to make money. So unfortunately, the onus is disappearing from the vets and having to go to a bit of, well, where do they go? So that's why Cam is here. You think as a vet, I realized people were thinking that what I was telling them was very biased. And I wanted to kind of step out the white coat, step out the building and say, I'm not making any money out of this. <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> but um. It is, we do need to educate more, I think, so that people feel confident rather than panicking and looking elsewhere. Or do you agree? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the responsibility is with the veterinarian, but also none of us are alone, right? I mean, there's a reason why you're doing what you're doing. There's a reason why I've spent, you know, 12 years trying to build a resource database that, that you know, I don't get paid for in any way, you know, just because people then can go and look at that. What I found is that when people go searching online, you're right. They they want to avoid sources that have obvious bias, but mm. that's not just industry, right? That's anybody who's selling anything. That's anybody who has a very strong opinion and doesn't have any evidence behind it. It's just their theory or their idea. I mean, we're all very invested in the things that we have said and, and put forward in all our careers. And it's mm. hard to let go of that when the evidence changes. So what I find is that when you go searching for things, almost everything you find is connected to some sort of, of commercial interest. Yeah. And, yeah. and I wanted to create just, something just, like you do that, that isn't that, right? We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't sell nothing. That's right. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the total truth, guys. Like people could say, well, why isn't the cam shop full of supplements and things that we can use? And it's because we don't want to bias you. The only bias that we give, which I think is very practical and it doesn't cost is more rugs, less drugs. We were talking about <laughs> So I really don't feel bad about that being my bias because I'm quite happy with that. But um, it is it is difficult, isn't it? As you say, biases are. Well, and no one is without bias. I mean, we don't. We, we shouldn't pretend that we are, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when people say, "Well, you just are against these things because you're paid by big pharma," I can say, "Well, that's ridiculous. I'm not paid by big pharma. I'm against these things because I don't think they work." But on mm -hmm. the other hand, sure, I have my bias and my limitations and my way of seeing things. All mm -hmm. I can do is give you that and give you the evidence behind it. Try to acknowledge that I have that, and you know, you, you do have to sort of shop around a little bit. But I think that the more we're aware of that and the harder we try, I mean, I have been in this business for a little over 20 years now, and I've had to change my mind a lot, yes. right? And I think that's hard for young vets because they feel like there should be right answers and they're not competent unless they know what they are. But as you get along in, in the business a while, you realize things change. And what you need is a system for figuring out when you need to throw something out that you used to believe in and when you need to take on something new that you didn't. And, yeah. and I think science is the best way to do that. It's not perfect. It's wrong all the time. It's just better than everything else we've tried, right? Yeah, yeah no, totally. And I think um, somebody has put a really good question here, which leads quite nicely. How do we quantify pain trials in practice from a pain behavior focused RVN, so registered vet nurse? So how do we keep an open mind, realize that some things are going to show evidence in a few years and some are going to fall off the bandwagon? How can we 
start being more objective and make sure our intervention is working and then we've got a long list of things that we have to answer <laughs> i know what i do so i i really like client specific outcome measures for a specific reason it allows me to educate yes the numerical forms that you've got load you've got cbpi you've got helsinki they're fantastic and they're validated and they you know i can't big them up enough and they suit certain personality types that do want to tick and get a number and they like the black and white number but I don't find it leaves me room to talk about why that dog's posture has changed or behavior has changed or movement pattern has changed so for me it allows me to educate and if they are educated they're on board and if they're on board we can get a good multimodal management plan that's my choice mm-hmm. um what kind of things do you use yeah, I mean, I think that there's not just one thing, right? As you say, the, the gold standard is always going to be the objective outcome measures in a well-designed multiple series of clinical trials. And I think we should aim for that. I don't think we should give up on that. Um, but in the absence of that, we don't just stand around with our hands in our pocket. We have to do stuff. So I do think that that it would be helpful if we were more consistent, if we could all get together and agree that here are a couple of tools, as you say, some suit different lifestyles or different personalities better, but here are a couple of tools that we all think are useful. And you know, if I saw you know, every one of my patients with a dog with chronic arthritis had some sort of intervention tool and maybe there were three or four of them that they were using and they were using them consistently, I'd get a lot better at interpreting what they're telling me about how their pets are doing. And yes. that would help us you know, all the bias and caveats still there, that would help us at making decisions about individual patients. So yeah, I think we need to systematize, we need to stop ad hocing it and get together and come up with some agreed upon ways to do this and then educate the public about why those are useful, right? Yeah, make them readily available and consumer comfortable. So just recently we've changed our newsletter. By the way, guys, newsletter, I'll put the links at the end of this, newsletter, newsletter. And um, the user experience is so important. You were talking about your media empire. (laughs) Great making it, but you've got to get people to use it. And that is something else. And we have become a a generation that want things done quick. And if there's any hindrance, if you have to go back or you have to click twice or you have to fill in something a bit more detail than you wanted to give, you just leave it. You walk away from it. And a lot of these um, objective tools are cumbersome let's be honest you know then they you have to remember to do them you have to go and get them you have to fill them in there's still many of them are paper-based so you can't actually do them on your smartphone whilst you're in the waiting room waiting to be seen we could make some real leaps forward with this to make it more consumer savvy but they are available they are available and as you say if people were willing to use them i think we'd get better something that i've been using on luna just a little bit of a shout out i did a post um, a pit pat. So it's the first one I've ever used. So I'm not saying it's the be all and end all, but it's the first time I've ever used an activity monitor. Mm-hmm. I wanted to try things out that are in a really sensible price point because you can buy a GPS one for like 200 bucks, but you know, she gets in the sea every second or so, you know, Thursday. So um, it's quite good though, you know, to just have a little bit more objective data, how much time she's been spent moving and the categories of movement. Do you ever use anything like that in your practice? You know, uh, so I have not um, been able to introduce that into the practice. I do have clients who use those and there are a variety of them and they're just very interested in them. Um, and and I think that in particular in clinical trials, they're, they're becoming more common as an objective outcome. So no, I was just actually, it's funny when you said that, I was just gonna say activity trackers are one of those things that you know many of us walk around with them and they've become quite sophisticated. And I do yeah. think that that if we put the time and energy into validating them as tools, that's a very low energy, you know, low intensity strategy that would give us useful information. What I liked was I saw a, a study that um, got sort of the opposite of their expectations, right? They were expecting them to become more active at night with the pain medication. Yeah. They found they became less active at night because they were less restless, because they were less painful. So I think it's really interesting to start playing with these things and see what we find out, because we might have yeah. the wrong assumptions to begin with about what to expect. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a wonderful tool. Yeah, well, there's um, there's a good website that's, um, I think it's called PetTracker.com and it's reviewing them. So I'm gonna write to them and say, send them to me. I want to- <laughs> Um, but um, a heads up, I know Duncan Lascelles and his team are doing some more work with the, the wearable devices. Cool. OK. Ready? It's a big one. The good old turmeric, the big T. 
Turmeric, yeah. So turmeric is really interesting. Um, it has a, <laughs> a lot of that preclinical research, right? Test tube lab animal stuff showing that it has anti-inflammatory properties. So it works in a way that is analogous to what the non-steroidals do, different pathways, different chemical details, but the same kind of idea. So what mm -hmm. that tells us is, yeah, it, it has a potential use. All the preclinical stuff, the test tubes in the lab animals just tell us maybe it might work. There's a reason to think it could. Now we go on to does it, right? And we have this great animal model called humans where they spend a lot of time and energy and money testing things on people. And it, it isn't always a great direct translation to our patients, but it's data we should take a look at and we can't ignore. So lots of data on turmeric in people. Um, particularly for arthritis. Couple of problems with it. One, it's not absorbed very well. It has very low bioavailability. So unless you do some fancy chemical things to it, um, you don't actually take very much of it in. So that's a classic example of why, yeah, great if you pour it on cells in a test tube, it works great, but you can't get it into your joints. So it's not working that way. So that's one issue to be aware of. Um, it does have some potential side effects. People will get stomach upset and things like that. As your question pointed out, it can it can interfere with or add on to the side effects of other drugs. So you really have to be careful. And this is a common misconception about supplements and herbal remedies in general, that they're totally safe and you can just pile them on with everything else you're doing and nothing bad can happen. They're chemicals, just like everything else. And they have risks and benefits. We just often don't know as much about them. So with turmeric, there are some concerns there. Um, in people, the, the, the evidence is mixed. There are, there are hundreds of trials, and when you look at the careful critical reviews of the trials, even for something specific like knee arthritis, there are three systematic reviews of arthritis in the human knee looking at turmeric. I mean, that's how much evidence there already is. One says it doesn't work. One says maybe we're not sure. The other says it, it does work. Right. So what that tells us is there's some possibility that it's helpful, but there's something we haven't figured out. Maybe it's the form it comes in. Maybe it's the dose. Maybe it's the kind of arthritis you have. Maybe it's how we test it. If it were knock it out of the park, guaranteed, really wonderful, we'd know that. Right. That's not hard to figure out. So the fact that the evidence is mixed means that there might be some benefits, but it's not going to be a slam dunk and it's not going to be perfect. In dogs, there's very, very little. There's a little bit on bioavailability. And just like in people, they often don't get much of what they take in. So mm -hmm. I think it's a maybe. I think it's a promising uh, outline for research. But I honestly don't think we know yet. And I do think we have to be careful about both the safety in itself and the whole does it even have any in it when you buy it problem with supplements in general. Yeah. So I definitely don't yeah. recommend it, but I don't chase people away from it if they're trying it. I just try to make sure they're not mixing it with things that might be a problem. That's it, exactly. So Vila, who is um, a vet who is part of the Brit British herbalists, veterinary herbalists, she said exactly that. You know, she wouldn't encourage any of her owners to start incorporating turmeric if they're already on a non-steroidal, because why you, you're already dealing with the Cox pathway. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there is, I think it is a bit dangerous, isn't it? Because we have a lot of people saying turmeric without actually listening to what the dog's already on and it features a lot on holly's army and the lovely cambastas do kind of step in and say do consider you're already on anti-inflammatories and what's sad is if you add turmeric and the dog gets diarrhea it'll be the non-steroidal that gets the blame so um i think you know let's be let's be honest right this one has got cbd in it Yikes. <laughs> no, CBD is great. CBD is one of those that, that um, it, it exemplifies both the good and the bad in the, in the whole veterinary new treatment business, right? Um, the good thing about it is that we're finally getting over our, our social and legal hangups about pot so that we can start researching what is really a fascinating and very um, promising collection of chemicals with potential mm -hmm. medical use, right? That's been really hampered by all of the anxiety about marijuana. Um, particularly here in the States. I don't know what it's like in other places, but here we're insanely puritanical. And, and so we just ignored all of that stuff for a while. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting research going on. And, um, and I think that there's some really good signs. There was a small study out of Colorado State University looking at dogs with arthritis, and they did find some measures of benefit. There were some glitches with that study, like, you know, their their objective measure, their force plate analysis didn't work. So, you know, their their placebo, they didn't have any placebo effect. And there's almost always a placebo effect on mm -hmm. in clinical trials. So I'm a little worried that something went wrong somewhere in the study, but it's a good beginning. It was pretty well designed and it did show some improvement in, in those mm -hmm. subjective measures of outcome. 
Um, there's, there's definitely research in people that is pretty solid that shows benefits for pain. Um, there's one form of CBD that's actually uh, licensed now for use in a certain kind of epilepsy in children. So that has been through the ringer as far as clinical studies and tests. Um, so from the good side, I think I'm, I'm very positive about both the fact that we're doing all this research finally, and that some of it is beginning to show benefits. Um, the downside of it is, of course, all the stuff's already on the market and we're all using it like crazy before we finish the process. And that's always what happens. You know, you know, the, the, the barn door isn't shut until the horse is six miles down the road, usually in veterinary medicine. And that's a little disappointing. So some of the things we're using it for, it may turn out to be great. And arthritis I'm, I'm, is one of the ones I'm most hopeful about. Some of them it clearly won't work for. Some of them it may even make worse. You know, there are, there are a lot of people using it for, for cognitive dysfunction in old dogs and in people. One of the most common side effects is is exacerbation of psychological problems. So I think there's a little concern there and we don't know yet. So yeah, I think it's one of those things where I wish we could do the research first and then gradually start using it where it helps. Yeah. That isn't how the process works. So what I tell people is um, promising but unproven. Be careful about your source. Uh, some companies are really good about providing what are called certificates of analysis, where they send it to a lab. You know, a lot of the states in the US, it's legal now, even though it's not at the federal level. So there are labs that do regular testing and they can tell you, you know, how much CBD is in it, how much THC is in it, whether there's any, you know, lead or mercury or anything that shouldn't be in it. Um, so I wouldn't buy it from a company that doesn't do that with every single batch they sell because that's really important. Um, it's quite hard to find the paperwork. Like I, I did a bit of research and I bought quite a few bits and bobs and was like, I wouldn't even be able to tell if this was a good independent certificate of analysis. You know, mm -hmm. that in itself is a mission, isn't it? It is. I mean, it takes a lot of work if you want to do that. But I, I feel mm -hmm. like that's where we are with it right now. And, and, and you know, I think mm -hmm. I'm hopeful about it. I haven't, you know, and people always say, well, but what do you think, right? Because we, we always want to go back to what have you seen in your patients? And I always tell people, well, you know, we've talked about why that isn't reliable, but it's what we have. So I'm happy to do it. And most of the time, what I see is the same thing that I used to see with glucosamine when I was given that all the time, which is everybody initially thinks it works. And then over time, it seems like it stops working. And to me, that's usually an indicator that it probably wasn't working at all. There was just a temporary change in either our perceptions of what was happening or all the other stuff we were doing for our dog that made yeah. them seem better. So so I think that that I think it probably will get there. I don't think it's there yet. Yeah. And then um, just so you guys know, over here in the UK, the VMD now sees it as a medicinal product. It's a medicinal intervention. And legally, us vets aren't allowed to prescribe it unless we've tried everything else. So we have the prescription cascade that we're supposed to follow. And we're supposed to make sure that we've tried other recognized interventions before we resort to prescribing it. So if you go and see your vet and go, well, I want to try CBD before you've tried, say, a non-steroidal, that vet's put in a really difficult position because there is way more evidence for the non-steroidal than there is for the CBD. And if you remember, we're dealing with pain. No one wants their dog to remain in pain. So just be kind to your vet about that one. Oh, God, here we go. Interested to hear his thoughts on red light therapy and uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so... Um... Let's start with, with PEMP first, pulsed electromagnetic frequency. Um, I did a, I've done a couple of posts on that over the years. And so every few years I look at it, this is really important for people to understand is that there's no final answer most of the time. The answers evolve over time. Um, and so far the answer is, I don't think there's much to it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, that it, in people, um, uh, where the, most of the research is done, it's pretty iffy whether it has an effect. Again, if you do a study where nobody's blinded and everybody knows what they're getting, everybody says they feel better. If you do a study where they're blinded, eh, not so much. If you do a study with objective outcomes, uh, even less. So, you know, it's the kind of thing where the better quality evidence shows not much benefit and the lower quality evidence. Mm -hmm those benefits. So the, the research as a whole is all kind of mixed together. And that's where you have to do the work of figuring out which studies are the more reliable. Very, very little in people um, uh, and, and even less in dogs. So again, I'm disappointed by, you know, some of the companies that are out there making really grand claims for it. I, I wouldn't shut the door on it. I think it's worth looking at. I think more research is absolutely reasonable um, because there's a basic mechanism behind which it could work. I just, you know, I've been talking about it for 10 or 12 years now, and I haven't seen anybody do that study or those studies yet. Um, no. I guess, as you say, there's, there's, there's science behind it having a potential benefit. 
now we need to actually go, does it have a benefit? And we had David Somerville on uh, about two weeks ago and we did all the electrotherapies and he's a scientist. So he's looking at it on from a very scientific perspective of can this work? Mm-hmm. Um, he has he does feel that there is more evidence with pmf and it would be what he would go to because of the scientific understanding of it being able to penetrate deeper to do what it's supposed to do whereas let's go on to the next one remember and that's it and that's an important thing to point out which is that um you know the first step is finding out could it work and you take something like I'll, i'll i'll throw the big one out there homeopathy you know there's no reason to think that could work in the first place and then there's research showing that it doesn't so that one you know is fairly easy something like pmf Uh, there's definitely reason to think it could work, but that's the beginning. Yes. In veterinary medicine, we're often stuck with that. So we do a lot of things on the basis of what we call pathophysiologic rationale, right? We understand how the disease works. We understand how the drug interacts with that, and it could work. And sometimes that's all we have, so we go with it. That's not wrong, as long as we are mindful of the fact that we don't know, does it work yet? And we still need to put the effort in to get those. So yeah, I think that's where a lot of those things are. And with the light therapy, you know, and, and I, you know, I don't know if we're talking just about like cold laser, because first, first of all, part of the problem is we toss this out there and it means a whole bunch of different things, you know, which wavelengths, how many joules per square centimeter for how long, you know, these are all very complicated things. So when people say I do light therapy or I do laser, I don't even know which one they're talking about. And that's been a big problem in the in the laser therapy in literature because one study will say yes and one study will say no and you look at their methods and they're using different wavelengths for different lengths of time at different energies. So who knows, right? Um, that's another one of those with um, some pretty reasonable preclinical research. I mean, there's again a pathway by which light might have some benefits if it penetrates into the tissue and that depends a lot on the wavelength and the energy and the time. And there's not much in the way of clinical research. There was an encouraging study recently on elbow arthritis in dogs, which I was actually fairly impressed with because I haven't been very impressed with the laser therapy literature so far. It seems to be mostly anecdote and poorly controlled studies. This was a pretty nicely done study and I do think they found some potential benefits. So I'm, I'm kind of perking up my ears, like maybe you know I need to look a little bit more at that one because generally you know, it hasn't been very good, but again, not something I ever closed the door on. And now I'm saying, well, yeah, that's, that's actually not bad. So again, it's one of those things that we talk about this as alternatives or adjunctive therapies, right? If your dog is really overweight and walking around on a slippery floor and not on an NSAID, don't start with laser because there's a lot we don't know yet. And even if it's helpful, it's probably going to be a small turn of the dial compared to all these other things that you can do. But yeah. could it have a place down the road in there somewhere? Sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really fascinating because when I listen to Louise Clark, she um, she always talks about multimodal management and marginal gains. You know, you've got a marginal gain here, here and here, and it creates a, a, a better endpoint. But there's no point in adding a marginal gain when you've got the option of a big gain and you're choosing to ignore it, I think. Um, so another thing, just so that a lot of people probably have therapists that do use things like PMF and do you think, use LED light therapy, laser therapy. Most of those people, I would imagine, are using some kind of objective monitoring as well. So I know that when I was taught um, with massage therapy, I'm doing a rehab diploma, is that it's also, also okay to try an intervention as long as you are checking in. Is it working? And so when I did my massage diploma, we have a, a three point rule that if after three interventions, you have had no gain on your objective measures, what you're doing ain't working <laughs> to be investing that time, energy and thought process into an alternative. Do you say that sort of thing to your clients? What's what's your angle of yeah, all, all the time? I mean, I, I start by saying, you know, he, here's one of those things that we don't know much about, but that there's a plausible hypothesis behind it or a little bit of evidence or even a gasp anecdote, right? I mean, there are people who tried it and said that it's worked for them. You know, remember, that's not automatically wrong. It's just not very reliable. So sometimes it's right, and sometimes it's wrong, and we don't know yet. And I say to people, here's something to try. Obviously, you know, you, you don't just dump them and forget it. You certainly don't do that with NSAIDs, right? You should be following and monitoring both benefits and risks and blood work and all kinds of things. And there's no reason not to do that with all of these other alternatives as well. I will say that I feel like that's what people do a lot though. 
I do feel like there's a perception that all of these other things are inherently safe. They can't do any harm. I don't know if they help or not, but why not? And then they start piling on things. And you know, when I ask them, well, do you think the CBD has been working after six months? They're like, I don't know. I just give it. It's cheap, whatever. You know, I do think that's a problem because I think you can get into harm from mixing things together. Just as there are additive benefits, there are additive risks when you start mixing stuff together. That There's not financial know. risks. Um, I did a post, it was good two years ago now, and I said, come on, guys, cough up. What do you spend per month on your dog on everything? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the posts that I got back were hilarious. And there were people going, don't tell my husband. This is absolutely <laughs> shocking. And lots of people were listing all of these um, things that don't cost that much. Well, it can't do any harm. I might as well. When you added that up, it became way higher than their non-steroidal, their vet, mm -hmm. it, you know, their hydrotherapy. Ooh. This sort of thing. You're like, actually, you know, you've got to be honest what you are spending. So and there's also time, right? <laughs> because people will come to me and say, well, you know, my dog started to have a little bit of a limp six months ago. So I thought, well, I'm afraid of NSAIDs. I'll try I'll try some CBD. Six months later, my dog is in terrible pain. And now I'm ready to try the drugs. And I'm like, you missed the window of opportunity to do things for that dog's disease progression and, and condition, right? Yeah. So part of the, the benefit of these kinds of alternatives is they give the agency to us as owners, right? We have something we don't need help with. We can go out and do. But then that also delays, you know, getting help when we need it and, and yeah. potentially creates more progression and worsening disease. So you know, yeah. that's the kind of indirect harm that you have to be mindful of. I think I think a way around that would also be the vet profession need to take hold of saying this non-steroidal doesn't need to be for life. Mm -hmm. Actually, we can use it as a springboard whilst you get the weight off, change the lifestyle, get a better exercise routine. And you can bring in these other therapies because if they do work, you won't be having that progressively deteriorating, waxing and waning mm -hmm. disaster. It's a lot harder. I think our brains want to just see things like switch on like a light bulb and switch off when you stop giving them nothing works. Well, and a lot of the studies actually use that as a marker of efficacy, right? They, they don't only look at pain, they look at whether people are able to reduce their dose of, of their NSAID or yes. reduce the frequency. And, and it's not an either or, it's about finding a combination of things that works for a particular patient. Um, yeah. You know, we don't want to be afraid of NSAIDs, but we don't want to just sort of toss them out there and rely on them forever. I mean, my last dog was a 75 pound mixed breed, you know, Akita lab, something, something from the shelter. And he had one bad hip and two bad elbows from three months old when I got him. Yeah. And then he blew out his knee and had a TPLO on the opposite side from the bad hip when he was six. So his joints were an issue forever. And, you know, I kept him skinny and I did all the sort of other things, but he was also on NSAIDs for eight years of his 16 years, right? Yeah. It, you know, people have the idea that you can't do that and yeah. you don't do it callously or without paying attention, exactly. but you absolutely can do it if it's appropriate for that pet and if you're paying attention. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree with that. Got one here. Um, I have no answer for this. Tissue salts? Uh, I don't know exactly what they're talking about there either. I mean, I'm, they're glandulars, which is a slightly different thing. But no, I don't know what that means. Maybe maybe you can can post the question. Maybe with Karen, a Karen can um, add that. Um, da, 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 da. There was another question a lady had up here. Oh, ah, it's always different. They bring a name brand in because <laughs> it yeah. makes slating a company. Not slating. Um, we're going to talk about the content, which is glucosamine and chondroitin. No, um, green lip muscle. Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of those what I call kitchen sink remedies. What what a lot of these companies do is they look at what has preclinical evidence, right? What has been shown in test tubes or lab mice to have some plausible reason why it might interact with arthritis in, in a positive way. And then they take six of those and lump them all together in a product and sell it to you as an arthritis treatment right, without having tested sometimes any of the individuals, but never the whole thing altogether the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of these products are. They're really just kind of going, got a big shotgun, let's try everything all at once and see what happens. And those are really hard to evaluate because, you know, first you have to spend the time going through every individual ingredient and what we know about them individually. And then you have to come down to, I still don't know what it all does together because nobody's looked at that, right? No, and, and are they in, in the right quantity? That's another yeah. And the dose and the form that it's in. and it's, Yeah. So that's a kind of a dodgy strategy to begin with, I think. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we want to talk about glucosamine. You know, as I said, 
that's one of those that I think is kind of starting to drift away a little bit. I mean, it was the thing for arthritis 20 years ago when I got out of vet school. And it's certainly still probably one of the most profitable and widely used. But I, I think it's an example of, of, you know, from a strictly evidence-based point of view, the evidence in humans is, is very, very robust and it almost certainly doesn't work. You have to do some really fussy little statistical analyses of subgroups of subgroups to find any benefit at all. So if it does anything at all, it's small enough that it's really hard to find. Mm -hmm. And two studies in dogs are not very good studies. And one didn't find any benefit. One found a small benefit, far less than carprofen, which is one of the non-steroidals. So, you know, the best, guess as far as what the evidence says is if it helps at all it's a tiny 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 little bit yeah. right the what about green, that though is, is that um you know it's it's taken the place of so many other things and people spend a lot of money on it and they always go to it first before they do other things that you know like losing weight so you know even if it has that tiny little benefit is it worth it depends on how you use it as a yeah. little adjunct to other better proven things sure all by itself as a way of avoiding doing these other things? No. No. And then um, I've got my head confused. Um, I think you, well, you move is green at muscle. So it's the EPA, mm -hmm. HA, ETA kind of combo. Right. Again, it's a tricky area, isn't it? Because the only study is the Hills JD study where they had it incorporated in a diet to a really quite high quantity. And that's a, that was a good study, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. To bring the non-steroidal dose down. And that's what everybody's kind of hanging their hat on and using and extrapolating from that, aren't they? And that's the same. It's the same with green lip muscle and with fish oils to some extent. You know, those are mostly mm -hmm. diet studies um, and they're pretty good studies insofar as they do show some benefit and some objective measures and they have reasonably good methods. They're all studies done by industry, you know, researchers. Right. So we can't mm -hmm. take away the potential for funding bias there. And um, they're not studies of using them independently as supplements rather than integrated into a diet. And that kind of thing makes a difference. You know, we don't always know what the interactions between things are, but we know there are interactions. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those where I, I think if, if you're going to do that, ideally you try to stick as close as you can to the protocol that's been tested and to the product that's been tested. Um, but there, you know, that's still pretty limited. You know, there's very little that we would do, certainly in human medicine, that, you know, tens of thousands of people would do and all the doctors in the country would recommend based on one study done by a company who's selling it. I mean, that's really not the kind of evidence that we would like to have. In veterinary medicine, we get stuck with it, so we do the best we can. Um, yeah. So I don't think there's any evidence to think that it's harmful, and that is an important consideration. It's the same with glucosamine. I always tell people, I don't think it does much. I don't think it does much for good or for ill. Um, if you want to keep giving it, fine, but please don't use it instead of dropping those 10 pounds and, and a nice NSAID and, you know, yeah. rehab and all that kind of stuff. And I hope people that have been watching these Facebook Lives that message is in every life. Wait, wait, wait. And yet again, today when I was walking Luna, I saw so many people that are absolutely oblivious that their dogs are overweight. They're oblivious of it. And um, it's something that we need to address, isn't it? Because people just don't recognize a waistline anymore. <laughs> well, one of the funniest things I saw, I mean, not funny, but also sad, is uh, my uh, office mate had a desk calendar a few years ago that was your sort of lab of the day desk calendar with all these Labrador retrievers. And every single one of them was grossly obese. And it sort of seems like we have the opposite problem in, in dog, you know, fashion that we have in human fashion, where we valorize big, heavy, chunky dogs the way we valorize mm -hmm. excessively skinny people, right? You know, we have an image of what a healthy dog is. And I tell people, I literally say to my clients, you'll know your dog is the right weight when people come up to you at the dog park and say, is he okay? He's really thin. Because yeah. So accustomed to looking at overweight dogs. And if people want something that they have control over, that ideally should be something. The problem is it gets tied up in the fact that food is how we show love and how we interact with our pets. And it's difficult. It's much easier to give them something and feel in control than to take away something, right? No, I totally agree. Totally agree. That leads us into this one, which is quite good. Are there any thoughts, studies of what we feed our dogs, types, brands, et cetera, with regards to benefiting their arthritis? I mean, there are a few studies on specific diets and, you know, you mentioned the Hills JD and there are a few studies on particular diets that do suggest that they will have some benefits in terms of arthritis. Um, mm -hmm. That comes with the big caveat that you're treating the whole dog, not just its arthritis and diet 
is something that affects the whole body system. So if you have a dog with kidney disease or if your dog is overweight, you know, you're not going to use a diet with a ton of fish oils that's really high in calories, right? Or a dog that's mm -hmm. a diet that's really high in protein. So you have to think about nutrition in a more global kind of way. Um, so I think diets are often not going to be a solution for people, even when there's reasonable evidence for them, because they they overlap with so many other health needs. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's a tough thing. And again, you know, even the most calorie restricted high fiber diet in the world can be fed to excess to a point where your dog is overweight. So the diet is not a magic wand that fixed the problem. The diet is just another tool that fits in. So there, there is some evidence, but most of the evidence is about things like calorie restriction, maintaining a good body condition score, and then to a lesser extent, tossing in a bunch of different kinds of supplements all together into a diet and seeing if they do better with their arthritis. Um, mm -hmm. It's tricky. There's a few, uh, I thought this talk might be interesting, but it has wildly exceeding expected. Well, thank you, Brian. There you go. <laughs> Enjoy that, Brennan. Um, uh, there was something else. Somebody was asking about how to know how to exercise their dog. It was all the way at the back, all the way back up here. Um, no, not that one. Yes, there was one about exercising. Here we go. It's a little bit off topic, but it's still very, very relevant. How should you exercise a dog with joint problems? Well, I'll give you my point of view, which is that um, the evidence is pretty overwhelming now in humans that activity is positive, you know, almost to an extreme. I mean, if you're not running triathlons every day, you know, if you're doing any kind of reasonable amount of exercise at all, more is almost always better. I mean, I think it's very clear that that in study after study that disability, both from arthritis and from sarcopenia or muscle wasting and all kinds of other problems is delayed dramatically by regular vigorous activity and exercise. And particularly aerobic exercise, strength training, and for people balance, because we're weird two-legged monsters who fall over a lot. That's less of a problem for our pets. Um, but you know, I do think that 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 is pretty clear. And I think it's funny that our approach to managing orthopedic conditions in dogs is mostly about restricting and limiting activity. Mm. And I think that we may be on the wrong path there. Um, we do have to be mindful of not forcing activity on a dog who's painful because we can't really assess how painful they are. So, you know, don't take your dog for a five mile run if you don't know for sure that they're comfortable and that they've trained up gradually to doing that and they're conditioned and all of those things. But I do think that, that vets in particular are really shy of recommending exercise and activity. And I think we need to do a more rather than less of that. Um, what we don't know is a lot about the specifics, what kinds of activity or exercise. You know, I'm a big runner and, and I had an Achilles tendon problem and I could go to the literature and here's a study of 500 people with this problem and here's the exercise that they do and it clearly improved their function, so I did it. You know, it, we don't have that for most of the, the physical manual therapy things that we do for dogs yet. Um, so mm -hmm. we're going to be discovering that some of the things we're trying out work and some of the things we're trying out probably don't work and we're going to have to adjust as we go along. But the general principle that I think you should do regular, moderate exercise scaled up gradually to condition them to a point that, you know, they can function at a higher level, I think is probably good. And it's probably good for you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think um, you said before we went live that rehab is really beginning to to come up and yeah I'm doing the CCRP rehab diploma at the University of Tennessee and I just I think for me about oh my god it must be about five years ago six years ago I just started looking at the volume of the body you know the muscle mass I, I emailed you the other day it's 45 percent of the body muscle mass and greyhounds it's like 50 to 60 percent we do so little we do so little for it as vets you know and um, I think it wouldn't it be amazing if when the dogs come in as pups and they're going through socialization, we talk to them about exercise and we talk mm -hmm. about posture and preventing harm and repetitive strain injuries. Because I know a lot of people have dogs and they'll say to me when they're seven or eight, but he's always walked like that. I'm like, so he's always walked really badly then, you know, mm -hmm. these little terriers that kind of lift up a leg and they've got knock knees and bent elbows and they're going, oh, dogs are amazing copers. But if we saw these dogs and owners went, I think he's walking strange or he doesn't stand properly or he sits to the side always, is that something to worry about? Then us vets can go, oh, brilliant. We're not going to offend them. <laughs> yes, we've got some pain here and here. Let's think about what we can do in the long term. Whereas at the moment, what happens is vets go, I don't want to break their heart. <laughs> their their one-year-old chihuahua has got you know bilateral paternal luxation and that's why 
yeah. in the back legs. It's really tricky, isn't it? I've had so many well, people. It is, you know, again. Particular, particularly for things that we can't do a lot about. I mean, you know, you take a lot of the bulldogs and some of those dogs and, and, you know, I, I don't think we know yet what we can do to help them compensate for what we've created. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. some of those problems are, are breeding problems as well as individual lifestyle management problems. And, and we have to own up to that. Um, and I do think that, that a lot of vets aren't ready to, to say that. I mean, I, I will say, you know, I have a lot of, I'm really interested in, in the development of rehab because actually in humans, physical therapy has, has undergone uh, a career progression from a very ad hoc, poorly evidence-based kind of quacky thing to a really solid, useful science. And, and I would like to see, you know, rehab in veterinary medicine start where they left off and, and take that path. But we're at a point where I don't feel like I can confidently t do gait analysis and do a lot of these things in my patients because I, I go to the literature and there's nothing, right? There's nothing there to tell me. And no, people who do the work, smart, you know, sorry. are still at the point where they're basing it on their individual patient experience, which is great. I mean, we need that, but then they need to turn those into hypotheses and those hypotheses into studies, and then that into evidence that the rest of us can use. And that's yeah. where I hope it goes. Yeah, no, definitely. No, the study sizes are very small. You know, things like hydrotherapy and underwater treadmill, and as you say, the laser therapies and all of these things, it's very, very difficult. Um, somebody got very specific. Um, would measuring C-reactive protein be useful to check information levels? Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, my, my best guess on that right now is probably not. There have been some studies of C-reactive protein in dogs for other kinds of indicators of systemic inflammation. It doesn't seem to work very well the way it does in humans. So, so I doubt it would be helpful for something like arthritis, which is often you know, fairly localized and specific. So I think the underlying idea that it would be nice to have an objective measure of inflammation besides taking, you know, a joint fluid sample or something invasive like that, having a biomarker would be a great way to make our studies better and to do clinical monitoring. And we have a few of those in veterinary medicine, but I don't think we have a good one for inflammation yet. No, there was a good live with Simon Tappin and we were talking about immune mediated arthritis and even if it's proper kind of inflammatory, they don't use C-reactive protein, it doesn't mm -hmm. tend to help them monitor the flares and stuff um, and yeah it'd be lovely to have one of these um, biomarkers but again we've got a lot of joints, <laughs> lot of joints. so they're still going to need to be a really good clinical examination great observational skills and um, last one and then we're going to do 10 top tips and i'm going to let you get on with your life <laughs> um, da -da 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 -da. That's interesting. As someone the other day had a German Shepherd a year old that always sits and sizes, is that something we should be looking for as a possible issue? I mean, I think it, I think it is. I think it, the German Shepherds, you know, were known for having a lot of hip and lower back problems, and and that some of that's conformational and and genetic. So yeah, I think it's always something to have looked at. Um, you know, I will say that that sometimes, you know, also we have our individual idiosyncrasies and they aren't always a pathology. So we have to be a little careful about overanalyzing stuff like that. But, but you know, look at the context, right? How is the dog moving? How is the dog functioning its day-to-day -day life? What's its gait like at different gait like at different speeds? You know, have a physical exam and say, does it show any hesitancy or discomfort in particular places? I mean, I think it's a great trigger to start, as you said, having a conversation about how your dog is doing and how it's built and what might be issues, even if it doesn't turn out to be a problem right now. I think so, totally. Yeah, I really do. And I think, um, the one thing that I've definitely found is that we all focus down on the joint, but there's also all the other soft tissues around it. And just an anecdote, pity me, I've got a really bad back at the moment and it's, um, I know it's muscular and it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. So I think a physical exam is always a really good thing whenever you think, is that right? Or could that be something? Because the earlier you catch these things, the better they are. And you might be able to even reverse them. Right. You've done amazing, mate. You've had some really lovely comments. Oh, thank you. Right, let's do 10 top tips. So I'm going to start with number 10. You're nine, I'm eight, seven, six, five. Okay, I have to use my fingers up. right now because I get confused. I feel like I'm on a game show now. <laughs> okay, so this is making sure that everybody can implement these. So we're not going to start talking about random, really expensive interventions. Number 10, weight control. I ah, to... Darn, you took mine. <laughs> so weight well, control is just... I'll it's, it's so play, you know, number nine is is regular exercise. You, can, you you shouldn't sit on the couch all day long, and neither should your dog. No, I like that. Number eight for me has to be look at what you do with your dog on a daily basis and see how you can make it useful. I I I personally think why do we feed them in bowls? I with these 
debilitated dogs that need to be up and moving and you want them to be balancing and shifting and you know all of that stuff spread the food put them in interactive toys snuffle mats things like that can be really really helpful number seven Number seven is don't believe everything you hear and also don't disbelieve everything you hear, right? You're, you're going to spend a lot of time and energy looking for information about what to do for your dog. Take it all with a grain of salt, but, you know, don't don't necessarily think there's going to be a simple single right answer to anything. Yeah, that leads nicely to number six. Start being objective. And there are plenty of tools out there. Um, Mike Consemius gave me a brilliant one the other day. So the Good Day, Bad Day Diary is on the website. Um, you can download it as a PDF, but then you have to cut it up into the little squares because you're not allowed to let yesterday or the day before influence today. So then you put it in a box and at the end of the month, then you can count up good days and bad days, but you're not allowed to let the day before influence you. <laughs> I thought that was so I love it. It's good, isn't it? Number five. Number five is uh, find trusted resources. You know, go to go to Cam obviously, and and you know you can you can go to my website if you want. But find sources of information that aren't selling you something, but that are trying to help you, and yeah. uh, and you know make a habit of of curating and looking at those kinds of resources. Yeah, actually, let's take a break. And what where you know your website and you've got a book out as well, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a book uh, called Placebos for Pets, The Truth About Alternative Medicine in Animals, which will probably ang anger plenty of you. But even if it does, honestly, I think there's useful information in there. I think I think anybody who's been watching this can see that that I tend to take a very open minded approach to things. And a lot of the the bottom line is, you know, we're not going to know uh, unless we figure it out in the right kind of way. So hopefully that's a resource and that's easy to use. Uh, the you know the website and all the other stuff is all free and easy and like I said yeah. I, don't, I don't take ads and right? get paid by anybody so you know yeah and it's it's easy read it's uh, it's well laid out it's easy to search for the content that you want and it's updated frequently so it's it's really great he's got brain that I want I'm going to <laughs> number four for me is the, uh, the repetitive strain injury thing I said it earlier more rugs less drugs I'm <laughs> really want the world to start looking at what environments we ask these dogs to live in and what influence they have on a present pain state and what influence they might have in creating a pain state so they, it's really not expensive to put rugs down and I also say to people you'll get used to seeing the sight of a rug you won't get used to losing your dog so these interventions can make a big difference number three number three I think is is a classic which is if you can you know talk to your vet. And, and when I say that, I mean, ask them your questions. I, I find that people so often come to me having already done something or not done something or thought about something because they, they didn't know that I would be knowledgeable about the subject or they didn't think I would have a positive opinion. You know, people don't want to ask you about CBD or they don't want to ask you about acupuncture or whatever. You know, just talk to your vet. And, and if you can't get a good open conversation and an exchange of ideas and information, Find someone you can get that from. Find someone whose personality and style works with you. Um, we are supposed to be a resource for you. And, and that's what we want to do and we spend all of our time doing. So use that if you can. Yeah, and I think the world is changing. Like telehealth and teleservices and online services are really being pushed, especially with the pandemic now. And um, wouldn't it be lovely if we all, all vets start teaming together and having resources that we know that that person is at the top of their game with that area. Mm -hmm. It's possible to know everything. You might be able to because you've got amazing brain. But <laughs> um, number two for me is have confidence. And this is daft, but I know when I'm listening to owners, and I don't tell people I'm a vet if I'm out walking Luna, and I listen to what they're saying and I'm thinking, oh, my oh no um from tonight please whoever's listened and they think oh that was something talk to people about it say well did you know actually that might not have the evidence and be confident and say exactly that because otherwise all these anecdotal stories and these wildfires continue to circulate and at the end of the day the dogs suffer number one Number one is give yourself a break. You cannot control everything and you cannot fix everything. You're doing the best you can for your dog. And if they develop arthritis, you didn't fail. You didn't do something wrong. You're doing the best you can. So so not every decision you make is life or death and, and give yourself a little bit of a break. Oh, God, I want you to be my vet. <laughs> <laughs> you're amazing. You're out in California, so you can't get him, guys. Us in the UK, we're stuck. <laughs> 
I've had a wicked evening. It's been absolutely beautiful. I'd love you to come back if you would mind maybe next year's springtime to come and chat. I'm really happy to. It's been a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Lovely. So, guys, what I'll do is I'll put all the links so you can go and find Skepvet. You can look at his book. We'll put a link. Is it in Amazon? Yeah, it's Amazon and all the all the big places you get stuff online, yeah. Places. And I'd like us all to say a massive thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, any questions, put them there and I'll see what I can do. Until next time. Bye. See you later.